Shall we read Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 2, point number 1 together? Reading, There is but only or one only living and true God, who is infinite in being and perfection, a most pure spirit, invisible, without body, parts, or passions, immutable, immense, eternal, incomprehensible, almighty, most wise, most holy, most free, most absolute, working all things according to the counsel of his immutable and most righteous will, for his own glory, most loving, gracious, merciful, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, forgiving iniquity, transgression and sin, and the rewarder of them that diligently seek him, and withal most just and terrible in his judgment, hating all sin, and who will by no means clear the guilty. So now this is the Westminster Divines um, collection of what is God. Okay. Now you will notice there are three parts in this chapter. Turn to the next page. Now there's a second part, point number two. And then there's a third part, point number three. Okay, so by God's grace, we'll finish this tonight. As, as I go through, if you have any question at any point of time, stop. Stop me. First of all, before we even begin, I want to say something. Christianity has become very distorted in the sense that we no longer see Christianity is truly not about us, but it's all about God. Maybe I should have asked you first. Do you think your salvation is about you? It is not. As tonight we will study by God's grace, even our salvation is about God. It is not about us. But we have reached a stage where we think that Christianity is about me. Okay, so it's very good after we covered bi the Bible, now we cover about God. The Christian must be very interested to know more about his or her God. We must be. It must be something that we are more interested than about our own salvation. Understand that? I'll say that again. The Christian must be more interested in knowing God than his own salvation even. Because the study of God, which is called theology. Theos, God, Logi, Logos, the study. The study of God is the highest form of knowledge. Only when you truly know God, then you would truly understand what your salvation is. Understand that? If you want to know more about your salvation and not interested in God, you will have a distorted concept of salvation and of your own life before God. Okay, so now this must be some, a chapter that we must be very excited about. Okay, so ask questions if you have. Let's start. First it begins by saying there is but one only living and true God. Okay, now, so as I always say, the, subscript, the superscript there, they are Bible verses. They don't come up with this out of their own imagination. There is but only, but one only. So one only can you do this? Those of you who have handphone, and can you just log on? Um, because it might help you. You log on to the, well, you type in Google Westminster Confession of Faith with Bible references in your Google. Okay, then you'll get to the Westminster Confession um, uh, page. Because as you click there, you will find all the Bible verses and references. Okay, it's there. All right? So, um, do you, can you, are you locked on? Okay. So, this is the... Oh. It's a laptop, it's not an iPad. <laughs> okay. And, for, do you have the Bible verses at the bottom? Yeah, oh, yeah. Are you click? Click the no, verse? it's already here. Oh, okay. So, um, Adrian, do you got the page? Have you got the page? Okay. Yes, it is, the page looks like that with this red, with this red column at the side. Ah, very good. Ah, Should no, not really. That? Tell your WhatsApp, all right? It's out already. Okay? So, now, you, it goes to the content page, then you click chapter number two. 
and then at the bottom, you just click any of the red numbers, it will give you all the verses at the bottom. So it's easy for you to refer. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, got it? Karen? All right? Got it? All right? So the Bible verses will appear, so it's a lot easier. Uh, for those who don't, then um, you just follow along. Okay, so now the, first, the very first thing you must, we must be very clear about is what is called um, monotheism. Okay, the very first thing the divines want, the, want us to realize and they define monotheism. What is monotheism? Mono is one, theism is God. Okay, about God, only one God. That's why it says one only, one only. Okay, so now in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, can we read Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 together? Now, this is the clear definition. Let's read quickly Deuteronomy 6, 4. Very straightforward. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Okay, so be, now monotheism is something that we must be very clear about because the world believes in many gods, all sorts of gods. But so the Westminster defines one people to be very clear there is no other god there's only one god but the clearer definition they put in is living and true god okay so there's only one living and true god all other gods are dead and they are false okay by the way uh, um, can you turn to under living and true god point number two right in so it's from 1 Thessalonians 1.9. Can we read this together? For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turn from God to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Alright? To serve the living and true God. Um, let me read to you also Jeremiah 10.10. 10. Those of you who have it, those of you who don't, you listen carefully. Jeremiah 10.10. 10. Let's read together. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and an everlasting King. You often hear people pray. How do you pray? You often hear people pray, uh, we approach you the true and living God. Right? True and living God. It's very often we say true and living God. But actually in the Bible, to be precise, God calls Himself the living and true God. <laughs> okay? So, now I'm not saying that you pray... Uh, God, you are the true and living God means you're theologically wrong theologically is still correct but let us be more precise God calls himself in 1 Thessalonians 1 now he say to serve the living and true God he's the true God, the living God okay, so um, I very often find myself needing to correct myself also I'm used to saying living, true and living God so the Bible says the living and true God why is he true? because he is living okay, he's true because he's living he, he ever liveth. Okay, so now here. Now the next thing is this. Who is infinite in being and perfection. Now, what is infinite? Why do, why do they want to talk about infinite? Now, infinite means God is not limited by time and space. Infinite. Do you have the concept of infinite? I think we cannot grasp infinite. Can anyone grasp infinite? We only know infinite is infinite. But can you begin to think of what infinite is? We cannot because it's infinite. Now, please remember one thing. Um, God is infinite. They define this first. I want us to have a very clear picture in our mind about God. The Westminster defines very rightly begins here. First of all, He's the only living and true God. Now, this only living and true God be clear in your mind who He is. This is the world. I'm not good at drawing the planet. This is planet Earth. No, too big. This is planet Earth. Okay? Now, then I draw the universe, the, the atmosphere, then outer space, right? Then the universe. Can we even begin to draw the Boundaries of the universe, we cannot. That's why it's called universe, right? We can't even begin where's the boundary of the universe. We cannot imagine, right? Now, well, the Bible calls this, well, the first heaven, second heaven, third heaven, the highest heaven. Now, you, we don't even know where this limit is, right? Now, God is infinite. What does infinite mean? Infinite means God is even beyond 
this limit, if there is a limit. Infinite means God is totally outside. Listen carefully, God is totally outside space. This is space, right? Space. God is totally outside space. Now we exist in time. We are constrained by time. What time is it? Today, next year? We are constrained by time. But when God, when you say God is infinite, He's the only God and He's an infinite being, or He's infinite, it means He's outside time and space. He's not constrained, He's not limited, He's beyond, He's infinite beyond this. What does this mean? It means that God is not limited by space, He's not limited by time, and I always say that, Time had a beginning. Please know that. You read Genesis 1 1. In the beginning. Means there was a beginning. Beginning of time. Means God, even before time existed, God created time. Or let, let there be time. Then there's such a thing as time. Okay? God is outside time. If God is limited by time, how can He create time, right? So God is outside time and He says time. Then time exists. Space. Before that, there's no such thing as space. So God exists outside all this. Can you understand that? We must know how minute, how insignificant we are when we think about God. God is not even constrained by time. Okay, that's why after we talk about omniscience, we'll talk about that a bit more. Omniscience. Okay, God is outside all this. You can't even begin to say, to imagine God working in time. That's why God says, a day is like a thousand years to me. Nothing. Because God is not saying like time passed very fast for him, all right? God is simply saying, you can't even begin to imagine how I work. If you begin to imagine, um, tomorrow something will happen. In God's, for God, there's no such thing as tomorrow something happens. We can't even begin to imagine what that means. He's infinite, okay? That's why he knows what will happen. He can see what is the future, the past. It all happens before him. So it's an amazing concept. Um, which we can't even begin to grasp. So God is infinite. Now, God is infinite in being and perfection. Okay, so He's infinite in being. He's not constrained by space and time. And He is infinite in perfection. Now, when we use the word perfection, it means, it means there's no, nothing to desire besides that. But He's infinite in perfection. Please remember all this, uh, because we are going to consolidate all of them into a definition which many of you already know. Alright, so it's infinite in perfection. And a most pure spirit. Alright, so he's infinite in perfection, he's a most pure spirit. At any time, if you want more definition of a certain word, ask, alright? So I'm not going to cover everything in a lot of detail, but if you always wondered about a particular thing, um, ask. Now, a most pure spirit. A most pure spirit... One of the things that is very important for the believer to know, why must we always say God is a spirit? And here, divine want to emphasize that He is a most pure spirit. Why is spirit very important? Actually, anyone? Why do you think God keeps saying, I'm a spirit, I'm a spirit? And then He met the lady and said, you must worship me in spirit. Um, why does God keep emphasizing He's a spirit? Why? Any ideas? Okay, um, you turn to the defin uh, turn to number six. All right, turn to number six. Or uh, uh, we move on first. All right, sorry, we move on first. Okay, I want to put this all together. Then we read one verse and then we cover it all. Now he's a most pure spirit. He is a spirit. Now he's invisible, without body parts. Okay, so I stop there. He's invisible without body parts. Invisible. So as a spirit, he's invisible. He's without body. He's without parts. Jennifer, do you have body? Do you have parts? Different parts of your body? God does not. Right? God does not have any part. He's a spirit. Now, why did God always emphasize that I do not have parts? I'm a spirit. Turn to Deuteronomy, the reference there, number 6 under parts, Deuteronomy um, chapter 4, verse 15. Okay? Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 15. Shall we read Deuteronomy 4, 15 together? Take ye heed, therefore, good heed unto yourselves. For ye saw no manner of similitude on the day that the Lord spake unto you in Horeb out of the midst of the fire, lest ye corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image, the similitude of any figure, 
the likeness of male or female. All right? So you get it? Why God says, I'm a spirit? Why he can't emphasize, I'm a spirit, I'm a spirit, I'm a spirit. It's because of commandment number what? Number two. Very good. What is commandment number two? We just studied on Sunday. Thou shalt not make any graven image. Number two, right? It's like a hook. Don't gra engrave any image or not bow down to them or serve them. All right? So, because of this, God said, I'm a spirit. Don't even try to imagine me. I'm a spirit. I'm infinite. Don't make a man. Don't make a bird. Don't make the sun. Don't make anything at all. I am a spirit. You can't make spirit. I have no body parts. I have no body. I have no parts. But then how come you always hear, my ear will hear your prayer. <laughs> my mouth will speak. Um, my heart is hurt. My hand will save you. Why all those? If God has a spirit, He said, I have no parts. Now, those are basically terms that God used to describe His actions in a way that human can understand. Understand that? So whenever God talks about that, it doesn't mean He has body parts. He's explaining what He does with us, to us, in us, with things, with a language that we can understand. Okay? So that's what it is. So don't imagine. Because if not, you say, God say, I am like the... The uh, hen that keep you under my wings. Then God is a big, they say a big cosmic feather bird. <laughs> no, right? God is not that. So we, we don't imagine. God will use all this to describe His love for us, His, what He does for us. Okay? That's why sometimes I hear people preach. Uh, they say the hand of God. Yeah, the hand of God. Then they preach the hand of God. Then they keep talking like God really have a hand and, and all those things. We can become, uh, mis we misunderstand that there's a hand that is floating around and writing words on the wall and all that. All right? So we must understand the language. So please remember the reason why God said no is we do not worship God by making anything. That's why the Roman Catholics, no matter what they say, they have gone against God's commandment. God said, do not make all this because I'm a spirit. Hey, let me ask you now then, does Jesus have body parts? Okay, in fact, uh, this is point number six, right? Point number six, under point number six, there's Luke 24, 39, right? Luke 24, 39, let's read Luke 24, 39. Behold, my hands and my feet, that it is I myself, handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. Oops. But God said, I'm a spirit. How come Jesus, when he's on earth, a spirit has no parts that you can handle, no flesh, no bones. By the way, after our resurrection, when we have the resurrected body, do you know what kind of body you have? Based on this verse? Because when we are resurrected, we have the body as Christ, right? So do you, we will have body, we have flesh and bones. Do you think we have blood? doesn't seem to describe that all right so it doesn't seem to have blood so next time we'll be bloodless i think all right so we have bone, bones and flesh um okay so now back to this so how do you say touch me i'm not a spirit has jesus now ceased to become god because he now has a body by the way the body of jesus exists in heaven today in body form understand that all right when he reigned on earth he will reign physically as with a body body okay the um, um, the glorious body so now how do you explain this verse when God says I don't have this is not saying that Jesus is no longer God alright Jesus is 100% God means he's 100% spirit but after his incarnation he also became 100% man understand that he's 100% and did he lose any any part of his 100% God, he did not. Okay, so this part here is emphasizing that God became man. Okay, took on the incarnated form. Then you think about this, uh, yeah. I have a question. Yeah. If God is outside time, hmm. shouldn't, Jesus shouldn't be bounded by the body at all, right? Because the time doesn't affect him at all. Okay, so very good question. God is outside time, right? Because Jesus was, is still God when he was in the flesh. So how can Jesus be bounded by the body, live in time? He should not be bounded by all this anymore. 
correct? So what's the answer? <laughs> Say again? He's 100% man. His 100% man part is bounded by time and space. But his 100% God part is not bounded by time and space. Okay? So that is something that we cannot imagine, alright? This is God. Okay? Remember Jesus when Nathan Nile was under the tree? Then he said, I saw you when you were under the tree. <laughs> but Jesus was not there. He was physically somewhere far away, a distance away from Nathan Nile. How come Jesus know that Nathan was sitting under a tree? Then Jesus also say, I am with you now and also in heaven. Right? I'm with you now, but I'm also in heaven. What Jesus is saying that is, yes, in my 100% man, I'm bounded. That's why he felt hunger, he felt thirst, um, he, 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 he felt pain, he had to sleep, he was bounded in time, he died in a certain point of time. His body was bounded by that, but at the same time, because at the same time, that's the key word, at the same time, he's God. That 100% that Godhood, he's not bounded. That's why he can say, I'm in heaven now. Do you know I'm in heaven now? <laughs> Although I'm talking to you, I'm also in heaven now. Because he's 100% God. Don't expect me to explain this to you in, <laughs> in uh, something that you can understand. Because you, we cannot, we can only know what God stated. Understand that? We can only know what God stated. This, in fact, is the proof that he was 100% man and 100% God. And the key word is, at the same time. He did not give up his Godhood. Okay? Understand that? Let's answer your question. Alright? So you cannot fully understand, but yes, his human form, because his 100% man is bounded, but his Godhood is not bounded at all. And he can exist both at the same time. Inseparable. Okay? Inseparable. Okay, next. Now, now number seven. Um, he is without passion. Okay. Without passion. Now, what does passion mean? Does it mean that God has no feelings and all? No. Based on the reference, I move quickly. Based on the reference, this passion, it simply means like the passions of human. The feelings of human. Okay? Actually, those of you who have the reference is very quick, right? Point number, reference 7, um, Acts 14, 11, okay, um, verse 15, Paul say, And saying, Sirs, why do ye these things? They bow down to him. We are men of like passions with you. We are like humans. We have anger, we have sin, we have hatred, we have weaknesses, we have emotions, we have, we have weaknesses. Alright? That kind of passion. Understand? Human passions. It's referring to human passions. It's not saying God has no love. Does God have love? The passion of love? Of course, God is love. He is the epitome of love. Okay, not that kind of passion, but the human passions. Okay, the human emotions, or especially the sinful weaknesses. Okay, so God does not have that. He is perfect. That's why He's infinitely perfect. Now, immutable. What is the word immutable? Immutable means unchangeable. God is unchangeable. Okay? God is unchangeable. Um, that's why in Malachi 3, 6, For I am the Lord, I change not. I'm the Lord, I change not. And this begs another question. If God changed not, did Jesus Christ change? At one time, He was only spirit. But now He is in bodily form. So God was not accurate. God did change. Jesus did change. How do you explain this? The immutability of God. God does not change. Terry, any idea? God said, I do not change. They said, oh, Jesus, but you change. <laughs> How? Colin? Any ideas? No? So did God change? Alex? Yeah, he doesn't but he became man. He became man. Now I'm asking questions not to make fun of you. It's to make you think. Because after that when you find the answer, oh, okay, I'll never forget this already. What is unchangeable? Now we have to understand the immutability, the unchangeableness of God has nothing to do with his physicalness. Okay, God's immutability is all to do with His 
character, his attributes, his attributes. I change not, therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Okay? So it's always about God's attributes. God's attributes. God's attributes. Now, okay, God's attributes. I wanted to say something now. Um, God does not change. Ah, now that is why that concept of many modern Christian writers is wrong. Now, most writers say the Old Testament God is what kind of God? Angry God. The New Testament God is what kind of God? Loving God, right? Now, do you think so? If God said, if it is about attributes, means his character, do you think God used to be an angry God, then he changed and become a loving God? God is just as a loving God as a judging God in the Old Testament as he is in the New Testament. Understand that. All right? God did not change. So the picture that people paint is a wrong picture altogether. God, you know, when I think about it, I think God's judgment today might be even more frightening than the Old Testament. It's just that it's not recorded. <laughs> We don't read it, that's all. We read in the Old Testament, whoa, God did this. Wow, that was that was serious, you know. But how do you but there are many things that God um, does in judging sin in today's world that just be, because it's not recorded in a Bible for us to read, we think that God is not judging anymore. God is still. God is just as loving also in the Old Testament. You think about how rebellious the children of Israel were. When you read the Old Testament, their rebelliousness and yet God remains so faithful in His covenant, you don't even read that in the New Testament. You don't even read about God telling over and over again how patient He is with His people. God was extremely loving in the Old Testament, alright? So remember His character. Okay, now the next. Immense. Immense. What is immense? This one we must read. Immense. Shall we read? 1 Kings 8.27 But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heaven and the heaven, heaven of heavens, cannot contain thee. How much less this house that I have builded. This is Solomon saying, right? Now, the heaven of heavens cannot contain you. He's infinite. He's infinite, immense. That is why we must understand the concept of God's omnipresence very correctly. Now, what's the meaning of God is omnipresent? Okay, maybe I ask. Uh, those who know, please bear with those who have or are learning this for the first time. Maybe I try Julia. Now, when we say God's omnipresence, all right, omnipresence means God is everywhere. All right, that is uh, what we always believe. All right, who? But if God is immense, we have to think God is everywhere very carefully. Now, Solomon said nothing can contain you. Means. This is, this is the universe. I use the word, this is the universe. Huh? Cannot see it. This little dot is the universe. I'm not saying this, the earth. This is the universe. God is infinite. He's beyond all this, right? That's why Solomon is right. How can I contain you in this little, this little palace that I create on earth? That, and when the universe, you are even beyond the universe, right? That's what he's saying, okay? Now, if God is beyond all this and... And the heaven can't even contain him. So when we say God is present everywhere, which is the common understanding of omnipresence, God is present everywhere. You have to think carefully. Is God present everywhere? When God is present everywhere, it means God has to squeeze himself in here to be present there. But because God is outside all this, what do you think is a better definition? Say again. We are in his presence. Or rather, everywhere is in His presence. That is more precise, biblically. That's why Solomon was very accurate. Theologically, of course, he's given the knowledge by God. Means everywhere is present before God. That's a big difference. Understand that. You must have a very huge view of God, you know, my friends. When we say God is present everywhere, means somehow God needs to be everywhere at the same time. But rather, everywhere is so minute 
Okay, let me ask you. If you, we are big compared to an ant, right? We are big compared to an ant. Um, in the ant's world, you see an ant nest, and then they're working, all right? Would the ant say, you are everywhere here? Means you're among them. But when the ant say, all of us are before you, it's a very different view. We must have the biggest, highest, biblical view of God. Okay, understand? So God is outside time. When you say God is everywhere, it means God has been constrained by space. But when you say everywhere is before God, then now God is infinite. God is not constrained by space or time. Now, even to be more precise, when we say God is immense, His omnipresence, more precise, we should say everywhere, everyone, everything is in God's presence. That, has, that only deals with space, right? God is outside time and space. But what about time? God is everywhere is present before Him. What should we add? Colin? It's outside time. Huh? At the same time. Everywhere, everyone, everything is present before Him. That space, because it's infinite, at the same time. That is the most precise definition of God's omnipresence. Now, what does it mean at the same time? What does it mean? It means that because this is the universe, and there is time, and there is space. There's time and space. But because God is outside this, it means this very important concept. God don't have to wait for tomorrow to come. Understand that? Tomorrow is already before Him. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Difficult. We can't. That's why he is infinite. He's infinite. He's immense. We, we cannot even begin to fathom. That is why God, that brings to the next definition of omni what? Huh? Omniscience. Very good. Thank you, Grace. Omniscience. Why is God all-knowing? We talk about it afterwards, alright? So now please know. You must even you must begin to imagine that time also to God is irrelevant. He's outside it. One thousand years from now is before God now. If you can use the word now with God. God is outside space and time. Understand that? So it's immense. Nothing can comp nothing can constrain or, or hold him. Number nine. And number the next. Eternal. What does eternal mean? Okay, eternal means no beginning, no ending. Before the world began, God already existed. Now, what, is, what does it mean, no beginning? We cannot understand. Okay, we cannot understand. So, God is, we cannot understand. What is no beginning? So, we will say, how did the world come, come about? The world had a beginning. It was created by God. Then, you, then they ask you, then how did God come about? <laughs> God, how did God come about? Then your answer is, God is eternal. God did not come about. God is eternal. He existed before time, before anything. If, if God had to be created, then He's no longer God. Okay? Can you understand that? Cannot. Cannot. That's why the Bible says, they that are not safe, they cannot understand these things. Neither they are foolishness to them. Okay? Now, next, incomprehensible was incomprehensible. Now, because he's infinite, um, he is above all, we cannot fully comprehend. Can you comprehend that he's infinite? Cannot. Can you comprehend that he's omniscient? Cannot. Can you comprehend? Cannot. Because he is God, he's infinite. We cannot comprehend. Then you say, what for study about God? Hmm. Whatever God wants us to know about Him, He reveals to us in His scriptures. Understand? So God wants us to know Him. The device is not saying incomprehensible means we can never expect to know God, let's go home. No, they are saying God is this immense, infinite, incomprehensible God and we thank God that He has revealed Himself to us in Holy Scriptures. We get to know things like He is beyond time and space. We get to know all these things. Okay? So he is incomprehensible, but we thank God he has revealed himself to us. Now, Almighty, now Almighty talks about 
his omni omni potence all right his omnipotence Om, almighty means you have all might omnipotent omnipotent means there's nothing that is impossible for him all might what is is there one thing that is impossible with god you know some people are very smart and like if god is omnipotent almighty he can do anything so can god sin <laughs> she would be funny right can god sin now this almighty is whatever needs power to do okay now then you ask them back okay if i ask you if someone tries to be funny with you when you preach the gospel your God is almighty, but he cannot sin, right? Satan is more mighty than him. Satan can sin, God cannot sin. There are people who actually said that. It's funny, one, once I was doing BBK on this, and then uh, just before that, the night before, um, John E. wrote an email to me. <laughs> he said, you know, I read in this website that the people say Satan is more powerful because Satan can sin, but God cannot. <laughs> So sin is more powerful than God. That's it. Come for BBK tomorrow. <laughs> I'm just going to prepare this, right? So what do you answer him? Satan is more powerful. Satan can sin. You see, God cannot sin. He's not Almighty. What do you answer? Um, <laughs> what would you do in that situation? Hmm. Yeah, and then Lucifer became better than God because he can sin and God could not. <laughs> it's not possible for a creation to be better than the creation. Yeah, not possible, but somehow this guy became more powerful. He could sin. God still could not. Then you answer the person. Say, Satan cannot not sin, but God can. <laughs> Satan, God is able not to sin. God has a power not to sin. Satan cannot. Satan will still sin. <laughs> right? I mean, they want to be funny, but the bottom line is this. Now, God... Remember, God is unchangeable. He's talking about His what? Attributes. His character. God can never go against His character. God has, God, if God goes against His attributes, then He's no longer God. If God sins, He's no longer God. But because He's God, He's able not to sin. He's perfect. Satan is not perfect. That's why Satan is not almighty. God is almighty. He's perfect. Perfect and not will not sin now okay most wise now next thing is most wise most wise is most omni what omni science all right always remember being able to he's wise he's all wise omniscient god knows all things okay by the way when we finish all this uh, i will ask you what does all this mean to you <laughs> okay what does studying god mean to you all right, so his most wise means he's omniscient. His omniscient means he knows all things. Now, why can God be all wise? Why can God... Now, this omniscience also means that God will never make a mistake. Right? Now, if you're all wise person, you will never make a wrong decision. We make wrong decisions all the time because we are not all wise. All right? Now, why will God never make a single mistake? We talked about that just now. Why will God never make a mistake? Why do you think so? Say again. Perfect. He's perfect. Yeah. Uh, okay. So he's perfect, but any decision that he makes will always be will, will not be mis will will not ah that was wrong that was a problem I shouldn't have made that decision. Why is God all wise? He he knows all things because of this picture again. God is outside time and space everything is present present before him and at the same time in other words god knows all things how come god knows all things because he's outside all things understand that that's why whatever god whatever decision god makes will never be wrong because he knows all things and he's perfect therefore everything that he does is always perfect okay understand the importance of that now Maybe at this point I'll ask you this then. We have studied about his omniscience, we studied about his omnipotence, we studied about his omnipresence. Okay? I should not want to ask this question. We should simply be interested in God. Wow. Okay. I'm so glad I learned something about God. Okay, but 
I want to ask, having learned this, what does it do to you? What does it do to you? There's a bigger picture, but I just talk about as a human first. All right? Now, knowing that God is omnipresent, what comfort does it bring you? What comfort does it bring you? I studied that God is omnipresent. You know, He is, I'm just, my whole future is before Him. Everything exists, He already knows everything perfectly about my life. He's omnipresent, He's omniscient. What does it do to you? <laughs> Say again? You can rely on Him. You can rely on Him. Because you can trust Him 100%. Because He knows all things. When you pray, the understanding that God is omniscient is the most comforting understanding. Because you know God already knows what is going to happen. When you pray, however God answers, because He's omniscient, He's omnipresent, you can trust His answer to be the best answer for your life. You understand that? This is what we must know when we study about God. The more, that's why I always emphasize, the more you know about God, and this is just scratching the surface, the more after this you go and think about Him, you study His Word, you read about Him, your life will change. You will not anymore doubt, fear, question God. That's why all these people who write articles like, um, I question God or I, I challenge God, they don't have an understanding of God's infiniteness, God's omniscience, God's omnipresence. Instead of writing articles like that, they say, I thank God. I thank God. I don't question Him. I don't challenge Him. I don't wonder why, he died, why did he do this? this I, I always share this. This author actually wrote, when this happened in my life, I questioned God and I challenged Christians to question God. No. Our understanding of God makes us bow, kneel, have a big smile on your face. God, you're omnipresent, you're omniscient. I really thank you for that. I don't have to worry. Understand that? Alright, so that is important. Now, what about this? What does omniscient and omnipresent make you fear also? <laughs> what does it make you fear? We only want to know oh, all the wonderful things. But knowing that that is God, the secret things that you and I do when no one sees, please know, <laughs> it is right before God at that very moment. You cheat, you lie, you steal, whatever. Whatever thoughts you are thinking. Now, the dif what's the difference between omniscience and omnipresence? Yes, omnipresence means can see. What is omniscience? Can know. Understand? Omniscience is wise, knowledge. God can know. All right? So you and I can, do, can sit there in secret and then not do anything but we are sinning. Well, God, you, you're present but you do not know. No. Omniscient means God can read your heart. God can read your heart. All the thoughts that you're thinking, He is knowing it very clearly. Now, when we understand God's omniscience and omnipresence, it should do this to you and I. When you're brushing your teeth, and then you're thinking, you're thinking of maybe, I'm so angry at this person, you must immediately stop it. You must know that God is reading and God is knowing your thought at that very moment. We must live in an existence of this very clear in our mind. God is omnipresent, omniscient, is infinite, everything is before Him at the same time. And this will control your lips, will control your thoughts. Do you understand what I'm saying? When you sit down and talk with your wife or your husband, and then you start to gossip, and then you start to talk about things that you shouldn't talk about, please know that God is just as present, listening, hearing, all those things, as if the person you're talking about is sitting next to you. <laughs> Understand that? Understanding the omnipresence, omniscience, the infiniteness of God governs our life. It changes our thinking. Do you go through the day, you just go through the day thinking of a lot of things. Sometimes we don't know that God is listening and God is seeing our very thoughts. 
that's going on in our minds. There's a person who wrote a book. Um, um, I don't support everything that he writes. Uh, I think he's a Roman Catholic priest. And he wrote about practicing the presence of God. Okay? That's a good concept. You know it's practicing the presence of God? You constantly practice and know that God is ever near me. What's the children's hymn? God is ever near me. Hearing what I say. And watching what I do. And so on. I can't remember. I thought the Sunday school teacher. Oh, if I know that song and teach the children, it's very good. God is ever near me, hearing what I say, and watching what my little hands are doing and what my eyes are seeing and all that. Practice the presence of God. All right? Studying about God um, must do this to us. Okay, so now we move on very quickly. All right? So I can only say those things. So God, those things must help us to know. Now, what about the next? Okay, He is most holy, most free. What is most free? Most free means He is not bound by men or anything. Most free. He answers to no one. He's free to do as he wishes. That's what it means. Okay? Um, most free. Let me say anything I learned to say. Okay? He does whatever he pleases. He answers to no one. That is what it means. We will study more about that, about sovereignty later. Now, most absolute. What is most absolute? Most absolute means he is self sufficient. Self sufficient. God answers to no one. He does not need anyone. He's self-sufficient. Absolute. Then the next is, okay, now I stop here. Okay, I stop here. Your question number one. I ask you a few questions. Your question number one, I ask you, overall, what does Westminster Confession of Faith 2.1 cover? Okay? Now, up to here, we have covered the attributes of God. Okay, we have studied the attributes of God. Because it's a very long statement, I want to split it up so that you know overall what it's covering. These are attributes of God. Then the next part, we are going to do the, the next part. There are three parts in here. Alright, now the next part. Let's read, shall we read up to own glory? Working all things according to the counsel of His own immutable and most right, righteous will for His own glory. Now, after describing the attributes or the character, characteristics and character of God, now the Westminster defines, talk about how he works. Okay? Now, working all things. All things means all things. Everything from every point of time. According to the counsel of his own immutable and most righteous will. Now, let's, we must refer to number 17. Can you refer to 17? 17, Ephesians 1.11. Okay, Ephesians 1.11. Can we please read aloud for those who do not have it? Ephesians 1.11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predicted according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Alright, so you see, they take it from him, from here. Now, what does all this mean? It says this. Now, this is the God that we have just barely scratched the surface and learned about, right? Now, then he says this. Now, this God, how does he work? He works all things according to the counsel of his own immutable and most righteous will. What's the meaning of counsel? The word counsel is advice 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 okay or will now he say what he advises himself no man advises him it is his own thoughts whatever he does is his own thoughts and this these thoughts are according to his immutable and righteous will now what does it mean immutable again immutable means unchangeable unchangeable Okay, it has to do now with his decrees, what he decreed that we study in the next chapter. Whatever God decrees, he will not change. Okay, so remember that. We'll study more next week, uh, the next round, when we study his decrees. All right, so he. Now, is this comforting? It is very comforting, you know. Please understand you worship and you have a God that is immutable in his character. We studied that just now. And he's immutable in his dealings with men. He said, I am God, I change not. It means that when He promised you salvation, He will never change. Do you know why your salvation is sure? Because God will not change or break His promises. Understand that. God's immutability is a very comforting doctrine to the believer. Okay? 
Now, immutable, um, the most righteous will. His will is always, means whatever he does is always righteous and it's according to his will. Okay, so now that. And then for his own glory. For his own glory. So the second part to your question on number one is the purpose of his works is for his glory. The first one we study about his attributes. The second one, the Westminster Divine's point out is everything that God does is for his own glory. He works all things. Now, I ask you this. I actually read Christians who ask this question. It seems that God is a very selfish and proud God because of Ephesians 1.11. Because whatever God does, the only thing He cares about, because it says that, according to His own immutable and righteous will for His own glory. He does all things for His own glory. Even our salvation. This God is actually quite... You see, you know, it's, it's very difficult for people to swallow. Don't teach this. Now, why do you think the Westminster Confession of Faith people cover all the infinite, incredible attributes of God before they talk about this? Why don't they talk about this first? Why not? It is first to set our minds to understand who this God is. He's beyond our imagination. He is so infinite. He is so perfect. He is so absolutely good. And then he talks about, and whatever he plans is for his own glory. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's to create the, in the believer never to doubt for a moment that this God is a selfish, self-centered God. Actually, I wanted to cover this at the end, but I'll say it now. Do you understand, after studying all this about God, how insignificant we are? Do you think God owes you to save you? No. Do you think God owes us anything? He is this God. I always say this, and I want us to remember, learning all this is telling us one thing. Even if God did not save, choose to save you and I, because simply because of who he is we must worship him do you understand that let that sink into our hearts let that be our daily concept about god the more that sinks into you and i the more our christian walk when we read the bible we read it differently that's why john says i must decrease and he must increase so my friends learn this very very well Right, that's why the Westminster Confession of Faith, they simply teach Ephesians 1.11 very clearly because God said, everything I do, I do for my glory. Because I deserve it. This is who I am. All right? If we want to do that, of course, we deserve to be called selfish, proud, and, and all that. All right? But He is God. He is God. He is this incomprehensible, almighty, all-wise, immutable, righteous God. Okay, so now next. What is the chief end of man? That is where we get it. Where is the chief end of man? The chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. That is why we get this. Even if God don't save us, our chief end must still be to glorify Him. I glorify Him not because I've been saved. I glorify Him because this is who this God is. I must glorify Him. Okay, so please understand that. Now next. Then this is the third part. Now this is the third part of this point number one. It's most loving, most gracious, merciful, long-suffering, abundant in goodness, truth, forgiving, iniquity, transgression, and sin. Now, what do you think is this, the third part about? The third part is about this God's dealing with men. Alright, so we study about his attributes, we study about his purposes, now we study about how he deals with us. Okay? So you understand point number one or not? Because you read one whole long chapter, what, what are they trying to say? I know a lot of details. He's, they're describing who God is. They describe that all things are for His glory. And then now they describe how He works, how He deals with men. Understand that? Okay, the three parts. Now, I'm not going to go through every detail in there. Um, okay, he's, now, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. God is 
abundant in goodness and he forgives. He's gracious, merciful, long-suffering. Now, why does why why all this description? After describing how perfect, how holy this God is, then the Westminster divine say this: this very perfect, infinite God. He is he he is concerned about you. Do you get things in perspective? You think of I always use this expression. You think of the cockroach that you see in your house. Okay? Or whatever that you find yucky and dirty and hateful. All right? You think of that cockroach. And then you know how infinitely great you are compared with the cockroach, right? <laughs> um, and then you get very interested after 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 the cockroaches tell each other in the house, wow, human beings, are, they are so clean, they are so perfect, they are so intelligent, they are so clever. And then the cockroach mother tells the cockroach son, but this cockroach, this man, he's very interested in us, you know. Every day, he kneel down and then see whether we got food and then drop some food to us and then clean us. Oh no, then there was once the car almost ran over me and then this, this man actually throw himself over the car and let the car run over him to save me. Why did the Westminster pain how infinite and how great God is? Then after that, they talk about his dealings with men. It's to cause us to get a perspective. Understand that. It is not to say how, how good we are and all. It's give us a perspective. Yet he is so long-suffering, so patient, so kind, so good towards people that are in this little speck. Understand that? All right. Now, next. Um... Do you know what's the difference between sin? Because here it says, um, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. What are the differences? Iniquity, transgression, and sin. Um, we have no time. You find out, and then if you can't find out, come and ask. All right? So he forgives this. Why don't he, why don't he just say sin? Why is iniquity, transgression, and sin? I did a bit of a definition in prayer meeting already, right? Now, then rewarder, rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now, this is significant. Remember before that, they say God is incomprehensible. God is incomprehensible. But now, they quote scriptures and say God is a rewarder of him that diligently seek him. Not through some mystical method, eh? through his word. So God says, I will reveal myself to you. I will make myself known to you if you diligently seek me. How do we diligently seek him? By coming to study God's word. By studying God's word yourself. By being diligent in understanding and knowing him through his holy scriptures. Okay, now next. Um, and with all most just and terrible in his judgments. Now, he also points to the other part. Hating all sin and who will by no means clear the guilty. Uh, God is also a just God. Doesn't mean He's long-suffering, He's kind, He's good, He's loving, He's merciful. He will not judge sin, no. God will judge sin. Okay? So you see a very balanced, beautiful, biblical picture painted to, to us about God. Understand? Okay, so remember that. So God will by no means clear the guilty. Don't think that God is only merciful. He is also terrible in His judgment. Um, Jennifer asked the other day, why is God called terrible? <laughs> you read many Bible verses, oh, thou art terrible, terrible, terrible. <laughs> so she asked a very good question, why is God called terrible? Because the word terrible, the English word used then and now, it's a bit different, just like gay, all right? Last time gay means happy, now gay means homosexual. All right, terrible, terrible means he is full of awe. It raises terror in man's heart, fear. All right, not terrible as in bad. Okay, not, not terrible. All right, terrible, not as in we understand it's terrible person means bad person. Okay, terrible in his judgment, fearsome in his judgments, hating all sin. All right, so that is one. Now, how am I ever going to finish this? <laughs> but I like to do this this way. You know why? Because we really have to think about God. In fact, we should spend a few weeks just on this. So much detail that I'm just skipping over even. Okay, so think more about this. Read, read, read and think. Okay, so now at this point, I want us to memorize what is God. Because I'll cover the next one also. Okay, can we please, when we finish chapter 1, we know we have a definition of the Bible. Now we must have a clear definition of what is God. I keep emphasizing that 
And I hope those who attended BBK just this Sunday understand why I emphasize it. It is not for fun. Until you have that definition of God in our heart and it begins to grow in clarity in our hearts, we will never have the kind of reverence and love for God. Okay? That's why I want you to memorize this. I've memorized this for many years. It is only beginning to dawn on me more and more. Okay? So, please. Now, what is God? Many times, this is, this is taken from Westminster Confession of the, the Shorter Catechism. Understand that? Now, they combine point number one and point number two. They combine it because it is too difficult for Phoebe and, and uh, Jennifer to understand. <laughs> understand that. You get the hint? It is for children. <laughs> Alright, the Westminster Conf Shorter Confession is for the younger ones because going through this point 1 and 2, 2.1, 2.2 is too elaborate. They want something that the children can grasp and can have in their heart. Understand that? Okay, so that is how it came about. You all know the story, right? So please be patient with those, those who do not know. How did this, this, this um, definition that we're going to talk about, how did it come about? The Westminster Divines, which we did in session number one, they gathered and they said, we got to create this shorter catechism for, for parents to use at home to catechize their children, to teach their children. So they said, okay, point 1.1 1. 1 and 1.2, This is we have to condense this. So they say, okay, we need to come up with a definition. So all these very senior, very, very wise, um, steep in gospel people, they say, oh, no, not me, not me. Too, too, too onerous. You want me to define God? I don't want that job. It's too onerous. It's too fearsome, fearful. So they turn and they all turn to the youngest one. The youngest one who was at least half a dozen years younger than me. Turn to the youngest one and say, you define. <laughs> so young ones always get bullied, right? None of them dare to touch it. You define. You go and study and you define. He didn't want, didn't want, didn't want. And finally, they push, push, push. They say. Then the young one said, okay, I will. I will. But you all promise one thing. You all pray for me, all right? You all pray for me. Actually, I learned that, you know. Do you know when Ling Kang asked me to take the youth work, the young people's work in Kerry Pandan? I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> and he said, please, 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 I need to go to BPCW. Please take over. And I said, I do it on one, one condition. You pray for me every week. <laughs> because I learned from this guy. He said, you pray for me. I think it's good. I said, okay, I'll pray for you. Now, he said, no, you, must, you all commit to pray for me, then I'll do it. Because it's just too heavy a burden. I, I felt that burden. So he said, okay, you'll pray for me. Then he said, okay, then let's all pray. So he said, let's start. We'll pray for you. Let's, let's just have a prayer now. So they bowed their heads, and then this young man started to pray. And then he prayed. Now, these people, they are so steep in God's word. Eh? Their picture of God is so clear in their mind. Eh? And then he just began by praying, O oh God, Thou who art a spirit, infinite, eternal, unchangeable, in your being, in your wisdom, in your power, in your holiness, in your justice, in your goodness, in your truth. Then the Westminster Divine here, he copied it down. At the end of the prayer meeting, he said, we got the definition already. <laughs> and that is how we get this definition. Bec not because he made it up, because the word of God is so clear in his mind. These people, they study, it must be like that for us. When we talk about God, we must be able to talk about him in all these terms, you know. And he just prayed out because that is him. And we just studied this and we have so many verses there. It's clear in their minds. Alright, so these are for children. Okay? Children. <laughs> God is a spirit. We studied that just now. And the reason why? Don't worship God in any idols. Alright? God is a spirit. He is infinite. Did we study that? We studied oh, no, no, it. We studied that. God is infinite. Infinite. Immutable, uh, sorry, infinite, eternal, right? We study eternal, we study eternal, right? No beginning, no end. Did we study immutable? Unchangeable, right? Unchangeable. God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. All right? Because we studied it, I want you to remember it. And every time you read the Bible, it becomes clearer. In His, sorry, in His being, in His being, His character. All right? In his wisdom, in his power. Did we study all this? We studied all this just now. 
right? And holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. Did we read all this in there? We read all this just now, all right? Not holiness, I think. Holiness is the next one. Justice is just. He's good. He's merciful. And he is love. True. True. He's truth. You know, he is um, righteous. Everything about him is truth. Um, okay, so, so you see this? So can we say God is a spirit? And you write this down because you're going to memorize it because the next time we come back, we're going to do this. God is a spirit. He's infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. Husband and wife, Every day, ask yourself, ask each other. Just keep quizzing each other until it becomes part of you. Now, this is very beautiful because it really encapsulates point one and two. When it becomes real in your life, every time, for me, really, every time I read the scriptures, some part of this comes to me. This is a very wonderful definition, all right? So please, memorize this. Memorize this. Now, I want you to understand one thing. Are we immutable are we um, infinite are we any of this no should we be any of this yes understand that now when you read scriptures these are called the non communicable attributes of god they are attributes they are non communicable it is it does not god does not communicate it to us these are called the communicable attributes these are what God wants us to be, wants us to bear. Why do we study all this? Because then we will be etched in our mind, I must be holy, I must be just, I must be good, I must be true. Okay? Okay, so now that's point number one. Okay? Right? So, we, so husband and wives keep quizzing each other And every time you read scriptures Some part of this will come to you and say God, you are so wonderful You don't know how to praise God When you did with prayer meeting, you praise God You go back, you take point number one And you pray through point number one Okay? Okay, point number two Very quickly, point number two And then we got to finish this up Now, point number two Um... Shall we read point number two together? Read once through and think in your mind. God hath all life, glory, goodness, blessedness, and in of himself, and is alone in and unto himself, all sufficient, not standing in need of any creatures which he hath made, not de deriving any glory from them, but only manifesting his own glory in, by, unto, and upon them. He is the alone fountain of all being, of whom, through whom, and to whom are all things, and hath most sovereign dominion over them, to do by them, for them, or upon them, whatsoever he pleaseth. In his sight all things are open and manifest. His knowledge is infinite, infallible, and independent upon the creature. So as nothing is to him contingent or uncertain, he is most holy in all his counsels, in all his works, and in all his commands. To him is due from angels and men, and every other creature, whatsoever worship, service, or obedience he is pleased to require of them. Get it? <laughs> all right. So here also three parts. Okay, I summarize for you first. All right. So, I tried to read it and try to think through how do I get this picture, this summary into us. Now, the first part is very clear. It is about God's self-sufficiency. That's the first part, to answer to your question number two. The first part, God's self-sufficiency. God is self-sufficient. It's every, very evident of the Bible verses quoted is God saying, I'm self-sufficient. Okay? Now, second part. Anyone want to guess? You read, right? It's about He do to men whatever He pleases. In fact, the word is that most sovereign dominion over them. About God's sovereignty. Describe His self-sufficiency 
Then he describes God's sovereignty. Alright? Then after that, he summarizes God is all sufficient, God is sovereign, and therefore the third part. Can please someone at least tell me? Look at your notes. What do you think is third part? Jason, want to try? What do you think the third part is about? Say again? Anyone? Say again? Um, okay, holiness, perfection is there, but he summarized it at the end. We should worship, serve, obey. Alright? So the third part is, first, said, first he said now, this God is self-sufficient. After describing how infinite he is, this God is sovereign. And then they close up by saying, therefore we must worship, serve, and obey him. Understand? Why do we study point one and two? It comes down to point number two, the last part. Because God is all this, therefore we must worship, serve, and obey Him. Get it or not? Right, Terry? All right? So this is the last part. Therefore, you look at how they finish. To Him is due from angels, men, every other creature, whatsoever worship, service, worship, service, Obedience is pleased to require of them. In other words, he's saying, whatever God says, I want you to worship me, I want you to serve me in anything, I require that. And we say, yes, you deserve that. <laughs> Alright? Understand that? I really hope uh, at the end of this, you go away from a little change in your heart, in my heart, that whatever God requires us to do, because He is this God, I, I can't even begin to think of questioning or disobeying or rejecting, but simply, yes, I will do. All right? Have that in your heart, my heart. Okay, so now, um, actually, because of the lack of time, I do want to finish this chapter. So you go back and read. All right? I, I just want to highlight a few things. Now, very straightforward, right? Um, God has life, glory, goodness, and all that is very straightforward. Now, he's all sufficient, standing in need of no man. I just want to highlight this one. Can you see on your third line? Not deriving any glory from them. Can you see that? Not deriving any glory from them. Understand this very carefully. God's glory is not dependent upon you and I. God does not derive any glory from us. Can you understand that? God is so glorious. He don't need us. He's self-sufficient. Even we don't exist, He's still glorious. And even if we exist, we do anything, it does not add to His glory. Can you please turn to the reference, number 30. Number 30. I want to talk about this because to correct certain concepts that is prevalent today. Number 30, Job 22.2. Can we read Job 22.2 together? Can a man be profitable unto God, as he that is wise may be profitable unto himself? Is it any pleasure to the Almighty that thou art righteous? Or is it gain to him that thou makest thyself, thy, thy ways perfect? Do you understand? Say, does, it gain, does God gain anything from the way you live? Whether you're righteous, whether you do things well, does God gain anything from you? Does, do you add anything to His glory? No. He does not derive any glory from us. Okay? You know that very famous saying? God is most glorified when I am never come across. Most satisfied. Now all these kind of very catchy phrase, we think carefully. Now we read here, whatever you do or don't do, does not add to His glory, does not profit God. God is so infinite, don't think for a moment that how you feel. God is most glorified even when I'm most satisfied. Don't think that your satisfaction with God makes God more glorified. Okay? Don't have that thought about ourselves. But what about the next phrase? Alright? 
Now, the divines are very careful to, divide, to define. He say, But only manifesting His glory in, by, unto, and upon them. God manifests His glory upon us. Not we, manif- not we cause God's glory to be more glorious. God manifests it on us. God put it on us. In other words, when we do anything that glorifies God, at the end of the day, it is God that puts it upon men, that reflects His glory. What you do as an individual personally does not add to God's glory. Okay? There is a, there is a subtle difference. Now, I know what these people are trying to say. Okay? But, and I'm not saying you can't say things like that. But when you say, be very clear in your mind what you're talking about. Understand that? Okay? Because I increasingly hear more and more preachers quote that. And every time I hear that, I cringe a little bit. I, I hope they really mean and understand that God is very clear. He says... Um, in Job 22, too, you cannot add to my glory. Okay, how you live cannot add to it. Yes. Yes, that is their second definition, that he he is that he hath uh, where is that? He, but only mes- only manifesting his glory in by unto and upon them. Okay, that we are his creation. That we live in a way acknowledging that we are His creation. That we have no rights and He is our Creator. He owns us. We owe everything to Him and we worship Him. That is how we manifest God's glory. We manifest means we are just showing who this God is. Understand that? I hope you grasp it in your mind. I'm just manifesting who this God is by the way I live. When you obey God, it is not because you obey God. He's such a good God, therefore I obey Him. It shows that he's a good God. No. You know, children say, I obey my dad because he's a good dad. There's a difference between my dad is good. Full stop. There's a difference. When we, when we say we glorify God, we simply live in a way which shows that he is God and therefore deserve all this. Not because I do this now, it shows that he is a, he is a glorious God. Right? There's a subtle difference. All right? I don't go into too much, but I always have this very humble idea. I do nothing to add to the glory of God. I, when I glorify God, it's simply whatever I do, I want the people to know that this is God. This is God. And He deserves my living and my worship. My all. When you go to the same hmm. God, you hmm. Yes, of course. Because you're telling Him His attributes. He's a God of love. He's a God who is just, who will judge sin. Yeah, so you're glorifying by explaining the attributes. So when God manifests, that's why they're very accurate. They say God manifests His glory. Reflect who He is. We are just reflecting. By what we do, we do not make Him glorious. We are manifesting who He is. That's the difference. We, we manifest who He is versus we do something and add to that this is God. That's a difference. All right? So it's interesting that the Westminster defense are very clear in their doctrine. Okay, so just, if you don't understand, just think about it slowly. It will dawn on you. All right? Okay, next, I've got to move very quickly. Now, next thing he says, um, in all things, that's why you see here, um, you know, in, in his sight, all things are open and manifest. We studied that omnipresence, right? All things are manifest. That's why you see how precise the de- definition is? All things are open and manifest in his sight, before him. Now, his knowledge is infinite, independent upon the creature. Please notice, independent upon the creature. Understand this very clearly because, again, of the new doctrine. The new theology now, which is very popular, is called the new perspective and and all that stuff. They say that the future is not known yet. God is waiting and watching what you do. All right? So, for example, what you choose is going to determine what God will do tomorrow. Okay, that's called open theism. The future is not known. But we just learned that all things are present before Him at the same time. God is outside time and space. He's not constrained by what you will do or not do. Understand that? Okay, so please know. He's not const- he, he is independent upon the creature. Okay? Um, we will learn sovereignty under decree. Sovereignty. What is the sovereignty of God? The more you understand sovereignty of God, the better you live your Christian walk. Now, to Him is due, now finally say, to Him is due from angels, from men, every creature, 
whatsoever worship, service, obedience is placed to require of them. He never talked about salvation here. He simply said, this is God. He's the all-sufficient God. We must worship Him. Full stop. That's it. Alright? I hope this has humbled us. I hope this has humbled us to the point where we know that even if God don't save us, He is God. I bow and worship Him. He owe me nothing. It's very humbling. I remember once a preacher preached and I went back, I couldn't sleep for a few nights. I called him up. I was so... I was so convinced by God loves me. Hmm? In fact, Sharon just reminded me the other day. Say, do you remember you made that phone call to that preacher? I was so convinced about the doctrine. I was so skewed on simply the doctrine God loves me. I want to know that God loves me. I want to sense that God loves me. So I kept working on that. Finally, I said, I can feel that God loves me. All right? Then this preacher preached. He said something to this effect. Basically, you know, um, God did not save you and I. And that is why it is for all things for His own glory. Your salvation also for His glory. Understand that, huh? Understand that. Be very clear in your mind. Then he preached something like that. Basically, God saved you for His own glory. He has nothing to do with you. I remember I was so angry, you know. God saved me because He loved me. Not because He is... He, because of His own glory, I couldn't sleep. It kept going on and I was very angry. And then I finally called him and said, You know, I, I worked so hard in experiencing God's love for me. And then you preach something like that. I said, I'm sorry to tell you, but it really upset me. Then he said this, I'm glad you're listening. <laughs> he said, I'm not even sure if anyone heard what I said. I said, yeah, but it troubled me. I wish I didn't hear that. Then he explained and then I began to understand. Truly, it is true. God is so great. He's so infinite. He is so independent of us. Everything he does is for his glory. And you, you cannot... You must understand that. Until this definition, as I said on Sunday in BBK, until this definition sinks in so clearly into you and grow in you, you will struggle with the concept that God saved you for His own glory, simply because of His glory. You will struggle with it, unless you know God's infinite, eternal, unchangeable being, wisdom, power, His all this thing, infinitely in all this thing. You cannot accept. You get angry. You even get angry that God, why must I obey you? Why? Understand that? So, point one and two is to drum that into us. Who God is and who we are. Alright, so I need to finish the last one in 10 minutes, which is very important. Then we finish this chapter. This one anyway is very familiar to all of you. Now, this is a very important point. Number three. Okay, number three. Now, let's read number three together. In the unity of the Godhead, there be three persons of one substance, power and eternity God the Father God the Son and God the Holy Ghost the Father is of none neither begotten nor proceeding the Son is eternally begotten of the Father the Holy Ghost eternally proceeding from the Father and the Son okay very straightforward <laughs> not so straightforward okay I want you to answer a few questions here number one how many persons hey point number four so point number four we studied 2.1, 2.2. Question number four. Can you answer this question? What responses must point number 2.1 and 2.2 with WCF, not WCR, bring about in us? Say again. <laughs> Humility. Yes. And ultimately, it must cause us to, like they summarize, worship, serve, and obey this God. That's why we study about Him. What responses must 2.1, 2.2 bring out in us? They summarize for you. Worship, serve, and obey. Joyfully. It's God. you rather obey something else? Okay, now. So, point number three, question number three. What do you think question number three covers? The T word. What's that? Trinity. Alright, it's about Trinity. Now, I want to answer, answer a few questions. Very quickly, number one. How many persons are there in the unity of the Godhead? How many? One or three? How many persons? Three, three persons. You sure? They're united. They're one. But they're one. No, it's three persons. Understand? There are three persons, one God. Three persons. Why is very important to understand persons? Because they are individuals. It's a father. It's the son. It's the Holy Ghost. That's why they separate it out. Three persons. Okay? Because people are very confused. They say, 
one God. So it cannot be three persons, right? One person, right? No, it's three persons, one God. Are they three same persons? No. Are they three same persons? No. Good. Are they of the same essence? Same attributes? Yes. So point one and two point one, two point two, are they the same in all these things? Yes, although they are three different persons. Okay? Now we cannot think of persons like human being persons. Uh. Persons means means individuals. Okay, individuals that have their own emotions and responses. Christ was on earth. Alright? When Christ died on the cross, did the Father die on the cross? <laughs> when Christ died on the cross, did the Father die on the cross? No. That's why they're different persons. Understand? They're individuals. Okay, so next one. That's why they, they dis describe here unity of Godhead be three persons. Alright? Understand? Three persons. But one substance. Power and eternity. One substance, power and eternity is to define their attributes. Same attributes. Same essence. Okay, the next one. Give the verses, point number, question six. Give the verses that affirms that the Father is God, the Lord Jesus is God, the Holy Spirit is God. I want to give it to you. Okay, please, no. Because after evangelism, once someone came back and asked me, someone asked me, the Holy Spirit is not God. You prove to me that the Holy Spirit is God. 100% true, huh? how to prove? All right? So you must know that the Bible has verses that state that God, the Father is God, God the Son is God, God the Holy Spirit is God. Now where are they? I give it to you. Now Jesus is God. Uh, the Father is God. Romans 15, 6. Okay? The Son is God. 1 Timothy 3.16. The Holy Spirit is God. Where? Which book, at least, please tell me. Which book tells us that the Holy Spirit is God? You must know. <laughs> huh? Very good. Acts. We studied it, right? The book of Acts reveals to us that Jesus is God. Which incident? Hmm? Say again. Uh, no, Pentecost doesn't tell us that. Okay, let's go very quickly. I, I need you to know that Jesus is God. Father is God, no, no problem. All right? Now, Jesus is God. Now, please understand, now, you have to really be able to defend this. Um, when I was doing the Roman Catholic, uh, the, the Islam um, session with um, the young adults, I read to them a passage in um, their writings. They write that one day, God will ask, I, I couldn't find it today, one day in their Quran, one day God will ask Jesus, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, and it's not exact words from the Quran. One day God, the Father, will ask Jesus, Did you teach that you are God? And then Jesus will answer, I never teach such a thing. I never taught such a thing, and how can I, when I, is, I am not God, it does not belong to me to teach such a thing. Understand that, huh? So that is why they always tell Jesus is not God, they, because they are told that. And then, they will, they will, and then Jesus said, Oh no, you know, I will give all glory to you, only you, Father, are God. That kind of thing. Okay, so you say, no, Jesus is not God. Now, this is a very important... Can you turn to 1 Timothy 3.16? Oh, we're running out of time. 1 Timothy 3.16. Can um, Edward read for us? Now, let me ask you one thing. All the description manifest in the flesh, me came and became human. All right, came and became human and then preached to the Gentiles and, and all that. Who does this refer to? Hmm? Jesus. All right, no one can deny that. It's about Jesus. Jesus was all these things. Right now. Okay? Now, what does the Bible say Jesus was? He said, God was. God was manifest in the flesh. So who is God? Jesus. Who is Jesus? God. Right? This is a definitive proof verse that Jesus is God. God was manifest in the flesh. Jesus was manifest in the flesh. Now, let me ask you one thing. If I say this, if I say this, He was manifest in the flesh, da-da-da-da-da-da. Does this prove that Jesus is God? 
Hmm? Will this prove that Jesus Christ said he was manifest in the flesh? Then you place he with Jesus, right? Does, does it mean Jesus is God? Jesus is just he, right or not? Jesus is just he. he was, I'm just stating a fact. He was manifest in the flesh. This verse, you refer, when you want to buy a Bible, check this verse. It has been changed to he, the proof verse. When the people were creating the new um, Greek text, the corrupt text, which you studied the other time, the Unitarians fought very hard to remove the word God. To remove the word God and change it to He. Because they knew that as long as this verse in the Bible, you always have a definitive proof verse in the Bible that Jesus is God. Understand that? Who don't understand? Okay? Alright? Please know, this is a very critical thing. So, in Hebrew, it's very simple. This is the word for... This is the word for God. You cannot see. You know Theos? Right? Theos? Theos. Theos. Alright? So they argue that it is just this. Os. To he. To change to he. That's all. They want to remove the first two alphabets. So do you think alphabets are important? You see how important the alphabets are? Okay, so God preserves his words. Not just doctrines. Okay, so now that. So these three, yeah? Now, the book of Acts is very simple, right? The incident was that uh, Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Spirit. Say, you, why do you lie to the Holy Ghost? And then why do you lie to God? Means the Holy Ghost is God. Alright? So we have all the proof verses. Move quickly. Next. Um, now, can you use a diagram to explain the Trinity? Okay, please. So, one way, I want you to know three things about the Trinity which must be very clear in your mind. Three things about the Trinity, alright? Three things. Number one, um, you look at your definition. Number one, now there are three persons. This is question number seven, alright? What are the three points you must remember? Number one, there are three persons. Three distinct persons. There are three distinct persons. Number two, they are of the same essence. Same essence means they are all, they have the same quality, God. Okay? And the third one is, there is a functional hierarchy. There's a functional hierarchy. How do we see that in the Westminster Confession? They say that the Son is begotten of the Father, the Holy Ghost, proceeding from Father and Son. There's a hierarchy. Can you write down these three things? Alright? Now, I want you to understand this. I'm sorry, we are running a bit late. There's a very simple way to crystallize the, whole, the Trinity doctrine in your mind. You draw this. Center is God. Those of you already know. Alright. Maybe I draw a circle. Um, or I can draw like that. Now, this is the Father. This is the Son. This is the Holy Ghost. Alright. Okay, now you put this equal. Equal means what? Son is God, Fa Holy Ghost is God, Father is God, right? Okay, understand that. Now, then you put a cross. What does it mean? Because the distinct person is the Son, the Father. No, is the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost? Are they each other? No. So, with this, you describe all. What about the hierarchy? The father, at the apex of the triangle, for example, a hierarchy. But is the father greater than the son? No, because they're all equal, right? Understand that or not? Okay? Now, please, um, this is significant because... Now, this one, straightforward. We already proved the Bible verses. You can write the Bible verses, right? So, we've proven that. Now, now you have this question here. Because the Bible says... Jesus is the only begotten son. So, the cults and the Muslims say that Jesus is begotten, means he's born of the Father. And then the Westminster also say that eternally begotten, and then the Holy Ghost eternally is proceeding. Okay? So now, I ask you the question number 10. 
Now, question number nine. You have to understand these biblical terms. Huh? So, how do you explain? Jesus is the only begotten Son. Means God gave birth to Jesus. God created Jesus. It came from God the Father. Right? Begotten. And then the Holy Spirit was proceeded from them. The Bible verses are there. You read it. You say God is the only begotten Son. Yes, Jesus. Yes, true. And then, say, and then the Bible verse there says that Jesus said that I and the Father send the Holy Spirit. Now, what does all this mean? Do you know what's begotten? Begotten means... Uh, begot, the word begotten means... means um, proceeding from, comes from. Okay? But only begotten. Now, the word is monogenes means it is a unique coming from. Okay? It is not something that means that he was created. Now, in the hierarchy, let me ask you, who sent Jesus to earth? Huh? The Father, right? Coming from the Father. Okay? But you remember now, this is eternal begot eternally begotten. It is something that means it is, there's no beginning, no end. It is not talking about giving birth to or creating. It is something that means they are of the same essence it comes from. You, you can't explain more than that. Now, um, maybe... Okay, so... Write this down. It helps. I found this definition very helpful. Now, the only begotten means eternal, unique, not created. Eternal, unique, and not created. When you read the Bible, description of Jesus is always that. Don't try to explain more than that. If you try to explain more than that, you get into trouble. Because it's something that we cannot explain. What I'm trying to say is God simply stated we understand it, we believe it by faith. That's it. Because Jesus is eternal, then He cannot be created. Okay? So this only begotten means it is being sent from the Father, it is from the Father, and it's of the same essence of the Father, they are the same. Now, what does eternally proceeding mean? Remember Jesus said, when I leave, I will send the Holy Ghost. Right not? And the, Holy, and the Father, the Holy Ghost is from the Father, right or not? Okay, now what is this proceeding? It's simply, all these are talking, the proceeding is talking about the hierarchy. Understand that, the hierarchy. So now, if they are all equal, if they are all equal, does it mean they are also equal in function? Equal in function? Equal in role? Different. Understand that, they are different. Did the Father come to die? No. Did, the, did Jesus become, hang around after he go away and then be our comforter? No. It was the Holy Ghost role. Understand that? Now, you, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, um, I think verse 3 or 4, it makes very clear. Who is the head of Jesus? Okay, you better read this yourself. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Please turn there. Because some people, they really didn't, didn't believe this until they see it for their own eyes. Say, so how can God have a head? He is God. How can God have a head? 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Can we read verse 2? Uh, verse 3 together. Shall we read verse 3 together? But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. So does Christ have a head? Is Christ under authority? Head means authority. He is. Alright? But is He God? Yes. Is He any less God than God the Father? No. So you have to understand the difference between functional role within the Trinity. There are functional roles. The Son obeyed the Father in coming. Right? The Holy Spirit obeyed the Father and Son in coming. The Father and Son send and the Holy Spirit said, I go. The Father said, Son, go die for the elect. Son said, I go. Understand? There is an authority. The point is this, even in the Trinity there is authority. How much more in the home? That's why God would use this verse to teach about headship in the home. Understand that? Okay? Ken? I don't know whether you know what I'm saying or not, because I'm rushing through. Okay, now I ask that one last question. Eh? No. Question by Now, what's the significance of the Trinity? They say, ah yeah, what's the big deal? Don't believe in Trinity, it's alright now. 
when you don't believe in Trinity, it simply means this. Maybe I ask Shalin, why is believing in the Trinity so important? If you don't believe in the Trinity, it means you, maybe there's something. Means one of them is not God. One of them is not God. That's why I don't believe in Trinity. Why the union parents don't believe in Trinity? Because they don't believe Jesus is God. So it's no such thing as Trinity means they are all God. Okay? They are all God. So not believing in Trinity is simply saying that one of them is not God and they always target Jesus Christ. Understand that? So is the Trinity doctrine important? Yes. Trinity says that they are all God. Okay, so that's why they deny the Trinity. Now, I ask you one last question, number 10. Because you better be able to answer this. Many, many Christians challenge that. I get this endless email from this ex-colleague. He said, do you see the word Trinity in the Bible? How do you answer those who refute the doctrine of Trinity? Because the word is not in the Bible. And he called us cults and all that. And he began by believing that all three are God. Yeah? And because he started denying the Trinity, in a few months, I slowly read his email, now he denies that Jesus is the same as God, the Father as God. Do you know what will happen when you start to reject Trinity? That is what will happen. You will eventually come to the conclusion, Jesus is not God. So you see, the word Trinity is not there. It is the cults that began with it. All you are cults because you believe in Trinity. How do you answer? The, the word is not in the Bible. I want to try. Is the word Bible in the Bible? <laughs> you try and find the word Bible in the Bible. This is the word, just now we begin, I purposely use the word monotheism, right? Monotheism is not disputed. Is the word monotheism in the Bible? No. Is the word incarnation in the Bible? What is incarnation? Not making tea, yeah? <laughs> incarnation milk. Now, incarnation means Jesus coming in the flesh. Do we ever dispute Jesus coming in the flesh? No. But... Is the word incarnation in the Bible? No. Right? There are many, many things we talk about. What about divinity? What about rapture? Is the word rapture in the Bible? You know what is rapture, right? We all disappear. What does the Bible describe that as? In a twinkling on an eye, an we will be caught up. The word is caught up. The word is not there. So we won't be raptured? That is not the way to argue it. Alright? So just because the word is not there, Trinity, is the doctrine of Trinity existent in the Bible? Yes. Right? It states very clear. I give you the verses. Each of them are God. Each of them functionally have their roles. It's all there. But yet, each of them are individuals. Okay? How do you prove that each of them are individuals existing at the same time as individuals? Those who do the BK must know. I ask this question. How do you know that God, the three of them are individuals? Because they are Christians who believe in modalism means in the Old Testament, God was the Father. In the New Testament, God became Jesus Christ. Then after the Gospel, God became the Holy Ghost. But they are, the, they are one God. Which Bible passage or occurrence will tell you straight away there are three distinct persons that exist at the same time, not an individual transforming at a different time? Huh? At the? Transfiguration... But the Holy Spirit didn't appear at the transfiguration. Yeah, we heard the Father's voice, Jesus was transformed, but the Holy Spirit wasn't there. Very good. At the baptism, all right, Matthew 3.16. All right, at the baptism of Jesus Christ. Did we hear the Father's voice? Yes. Did we see the Holy Spirit descending as a dove? Yes. Was Jesus Christ walking out of the water? Yes. Did they all exist separately at the same time? Yes. All right, that's the living proof of Trinity. What about one final verse about Trinity? 1 John 5, 7. Okay, so please know these two. Whenever they argue and dispute Trinity, these are your two distinctive proof verses. 1 John 5, 7. These three are one. Again, you go to the corrupt text. These three are one. is removed from the corrupt text. Okay, the proof text of Trinity is always attacked. You know why the proof text of Trinity must always be attacked? Because they must always attack that Jesus is God. That's the bottom line. It doesn't change. Okay? Alright, so we finish this. I'm sorry we are 10 minutes over. Any final questions? No? Okay, so I hope 
we have um, learned something about God tonight. Shall we pray? You have to be clear in your mind why it started. Why did it start? Because of the deep desire to have unity in the faith. Understand that? Unity in the faith. They wanted to make sure that the people have unity in the faith and the only way that the reformed faith will be preserved and people will be united and not go back to Roman Catholicism or false religions is to make sure that there is a standard, a standard that is set forth. Now, without this standard, they have no hope of bringing the nations together. They have no hope for the future.